This week, we welcome Jose and Enrique Cejas of Matilde Cigars. In the Debonair Ideal segment, we talk about the rules of cigar pairings. And in our Stogies of the Week, I go to the Oasis and Paul covers what could be a new favorite from Avo. Powered by the G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island and broadcasting from Studio C in North Carolina, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show! Partagas, since its introduction in 2014, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte has won critical acclaim in a devoted legion of fans. Flawless construction and full-bodied flavor are the hallmarks of this rich, dimensional cigar that features prevalent notes of wood and coffee. Made with a unique blend spanning three continents, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte is the perfect choice for any cigar smoking occasion. Cigar connoisseurs are already raving about this exquisite cigar which pays homage to Christopher Columbus's discovery of tobacco during his expedition of the New World. This medium to full-bodied cigar shows off the kind of exquisite construction expected by master blender A.J. Fernandez. This gorgeous box press cigar features a delicious dark chocolate Nicaraguan wrapper that houses a blend of Ometepe, Condega, and Estali filler bound with a Jalapa binder. Once lit, the perfectly balanced and refined New World gives off a beautiful billow of smoke and hits you with spice and citrus flavors. As you begin to lose yourself in the rich aromas of the New World, flavors become more complex and begin to express hints of hazelnut and coffee. The New World is a first-time collaboration between A.J. Fernandez and his father Ishmael, making this cigar stand out in the A.J. Fernandez line. To commemorate the union of father and son, A.J. Fernandez is offering you this masterpiece at an MSRP of $6, unheard of for a cigar of this caliber. A.J. Fernandez invites you to embark on the journey and smoke what he guarantees to be one of the most talked about cigars of the year, The New World, Cigar Journal's number one cigar of the year. Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the ultimate Ultra Premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Azan Cigars, Naya, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed to humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure the progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Welcome, everybody, to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 160 for October 15th, 2015. And I'm your host, Will Cooper. I'm manning the controls tonight. Now, we will have Paul later on in the show by the magic of technology, but um, I'm actually going to be manning the controls with the, uh, the first segment here. And um, tonight, we have a really great show planned. Um, you know, we'll go, we'll go through our stogies of the week, of course, our uh, debonair ideal, but we're really going to kick this thing off with a bang tonight. Um, on the lines via Skype, um, we have two friends of the show. I've gotten to know these gentlemen over the past couple of years, and um, they, they're just great people, and they make great cigars. Um, we have Jose Cejas, the one and only uh, cigar aficionado Hall of Famer, and his son Enrique. Jose and Enrique, Will Cooper here in North Carolina. Welcome to the Stogie Geek Show tonight. Thank you for inviting us. It's a pleasure to see you. Hi, Will. Thanks for inviting us, man. It's a pleasure. Thanks for coming on again. Um, it really, it really is our honor. Um, and uh, welcome back, Jose. I know we had you back on. Uh, we had it on about a year and a half ago. And Enrique, welcome as well. Um, Thank you. So I'm, I'm real excited tonight because um, 
I've been, uh, you guys have released a cigar uh, at the IPCPR, which we'll get into, the uh, Matilde Oscura, which is a cigar that I'm just telling you, it's a cigar that really wowed me. Um, but for folks who might not know about the Matilde brand, uh, why don't you give us a little overview for, for some folks who may not be familiar with your brand? Well, basically, uh, Matilde was an old brand. Uh, it was founded in 1876 by a man called Simeon um, the reason we chose this brand as our brand name was because of contractual reasons we couldn't use our last name. So we had two options. It was either creating a brand from scratch or uh, reviving something. And we thought that it was a great idea to revive something uh, that was Dominican. So we had a historian looking at different uh, brand names and we came along this uh, brand that was actually a tobacco company. They worked with tobacco, cigars, uh, cigarettes and everything. And we liked the name. And we decided to revive it. That's the reason our first line is Renacer. It's uh, Rebirth, which we thought was a great idea because it was a revival of this friend and uh, I guess a revival of my dad in some sort of a way that coming from working, making, you know, 50 million cigars to now, you know, manding a cigar factory of 12 employees. That, and that's a, you know, for folks who don't know, uh, Jose ran uh, Tobacco de Garcia. Uh, that is the largest cigar factory in the world that's located in the Dominican Republic. Great times um, there. Bro. So when you when you left when you left that factory, did you ever did you think that was it? You were done, or at some point did you know you always knew maybe you would think about trying to get back into making cigars again? I think I was uh, always convinced I was going to make cigars again. Definitely. Yeah. It, yeah, I guess it's. I hear a lot of people. It's kind of in their blood, you know. Um, and uh, but you kind of you you started this new company, and um, this year at the IPCPR trade show, you launched a cigar called the Matilde Oscura, which is your second line, correct? Yes. So, the Oscura. Tell us about this project. Well, this project is uh, basically in line with uh, our desire to present to the market uh, annually two, three, four projects, you know, uh, to give the consumer another option in a market where people are asking for new things. Uh, we wanted to make something different, so we use uh, tobaccos that are not normally used together, uh, not that I know of. Uh, like it fillers uh, from uh, Rolling, Pennsylvania, and mixed with uh, Pilote Dominican and some Nicaragua, uh, Su Sumatra binder, and, and the Mexican wrapper, which gave a very particular taste that people were not uh, accustomed to it. You know, something it's strong, it's just strong. Uh, it can give you a good kick if you, if you push the cigar, really, really good kick. And uh, then it mellows out and it start delivering some you know, different aromas. So we are very happy with the result of the product. At the IPCPR of uh, this, this year, this last year, uh, people who tasted it, uh, they like it uh, in, in big uh, quantity. So we were happy for that. And sales are showing that people are still liking it. So that's, uh, and, about, and this uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So, and this cigar has just hit the stores over the last couple of weeks, correct? Yes. It just started hitting the store. Uh, first shipment arrived uh, last week and it started hitting the stores uh, this week. So we're going to keep on shipping all the IPCPR orders and all the orders uh, in uh, basically in order of how people ordered them. So between this week and next week, we're going to be shipping all the orders that uh, were made. When you know after the Renaissance, when you thought about doing a second blend, was it always was an Oscura always kind of the plan for that, or was this just something that kind of came about? I think we can say it was a plan in Oscura. Mm -hmm. It was a plan to do it in Oscura. Uh, we uh, play with different names. Uh, some of them we couldn't use because they were they were really taken. Uh, now the cigar is uh, Oscura. It's, it's great. They name it, it's great. And uh, of course, the performance is fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Well, 
we wanted to do a, like our second line, we always started doing the Maduro wrapper, is, and that's the reason we chose the Oscura. And we wanted to blend the, the cigar, or the, make the blend around the Maduro wrapper instead of actually using our Renacer line, finding a wrapper that would work with it. We decided to get a blend that would work with the San Andrean wrapper, which is so good. Now, you brought up a good point, um, you know, Oscura versus Maduro. What can you tell our audience about the difference between the two? Well, Oscuro is, a, is simply darker. Maduro is a, it's the same thing, only a little bit more uh, than, than the, the Oscuro. The Maduro, the other way around, excuse me. The Maduro can be lighter and be dark, but Oscuro is... Definitely, by definition, gonna be done. Yep, yep, got got that. Because I sometimes will call it, you know, I'll sometimes confuse the two, even though I know that there is a difference between the two. Um, so you went, you went with the San Andreas wrapper. What 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 kind of? Because there's a lot of San Andreas wrapper in the market right now, and it's very popular. What kind of drove that decision? It's a uh, well. Good, good looking seal, uh, tobacco. It burns very nicely. It has a nice aroma. Uh, it blends uh, easily with other products, you know. Uh, and it was always there, only that it took its, its time to, to bring it to the level to which it is now. And now it's a very, very nice uh, wrapper. A lot of people want to buy it and use it, as you said uh, you know, earlier on. Well, I think the San Andrean wrapper has been uh, it's been very popular now. But I remember as a kid that used to still use it in uh, in his prior job. So I think one of the reasons is that you you like it a lot, no? That mm -hmm. flavor, that chocolatey flavor that comes out of Definitely, that San Andrean yeah, wrapper. So it was a no-brainer when he wanted to do a Maduro or a Scura cigar. He wanted to start with that San Andrean wrapper. Yes. We try other things, you know, but the San Andreas uh, is basically. Great. And this San Andres has a, at least one and a half years, you know, in, in the leaf and probably about eight, eight months in finished form. Mm -hmm. So it has, it has a great age. You don't get any anything here, metallic or, or, or bitterness in excess. It's very rounded, it's very balanced you know, between all the elements of the smoking. We are very happy with it. Yeah, absolutely, you should be. You know, when I look at this San Andreas wrapper, it is, you know, San Andreas sometimes has a little bit of a rugged look to me, but this is a really very smooth wrapper I'm looking at this thing, is, which is which is amazing here, because a lot of times, like I said, the San Andreas is a little rougher I look at. It's, uh, it's the way you handle the tobacco. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's, also, the opportunity to spend the wrappers on the cigars only if the wrappers are good, which can be done because uh, you have the control over it. In this particular case, uh, this is a wrapper that has been with us for, for that time, that, that period of time, and uh, we go to, to make cigars with it, and the first thing we say, you know, remember, those heavy veins, you know, so kill the smoke. So clean it out, you know, as much as you can, as much as you can. not in excess, a little bit of wrapper, but at least to have uh, a, a product that doesn't have this defect. And this uh, is it's a decision made by the factory to do it that way, or to go to cost and then roll it over the, the cigars, not, not cleaning it as, as we do which is a different ways of doing things. You know, so people say the, the stem is part of it, you know. I like uh, not too much stem on the, the lamina because it produces regular burning very easily. The cigars start, you know, burning suicide, and I hate that, you know. So I try to clean it out, clean it out. Well, always, we, we had a very good uh, crop, and uh, we always have to remember it's a natural product, so. We try to keep it as smooth as possible, but sometimes, you know, as I, and it's a natural product, the veins are there, it's a leaf. So even though we work very hard to keep them as smooth as possible, you're always going to find, I mean, veins or one or two cigars, a very thick vein, because 
at the end, it's, you know, it is what it is. As long as it's tasting good and it's burning right, I don't think it's yep. going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and sometimes you'll get color variations, too, especially with a darker wrapper. And that's, from what I understand, that's part of, you know, again, you know, the natural part of a tobacco leaf. You know, they, right. they're, they're not going to be they're not going to be all the same shape. Yeah. Well, that's fine. It's a, it's a, a very synthesis. Length of the cigar, the, the, the width of the, the cigar as well. Uh, so it depends on the position, as you all know, it depends on the position of the plant, the, how dark the, the priming, the, 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 the priming, the picking in, uh, in the plant, and that will give the cigar different colors to them. So if you go to a table of uh, really good tobacco, you'll find from light to dark. And that's very natural, you know, some people like it this way, and some people like it with light, some people like the, the, the obscuro, the, the dark. So uh, that's what the word is, you know, it's a difference, you know, so people have choices. Sure thing. Now, with, with San Andreas, you know, we were talking, you just kind of touched on this. It, San Andreas is very popular, but... I remember a few years ago when people w didn't want to say they were using San Andreas. Do you find that there was just as much San Andreas uh, being used when you were at Tobacco Lara Garcia? Um, or has there been an increase in the market since now it's become popular? I think it has, uh, it has produced an increase in the market. You know, because it, the people that are using San Andreas, let's put it this way, years ago, uh, all the sales of Mexican product was uh, uh, limited to the East, East Coast. The more you, you go back to South, you get people that would like you know, not to smoke so much the Mexican cigars, you know, something else. So using a cigar, the reception of Te Amo, I was a, a Nordic uh, you know, brand, nobody wants to have uh, a cigar with Mexican, Mexican tobacco at that time. Slowly, the Terran family has made a great job in improving the, the crops. They have, uh, you know, controlled uh, you know, sheds for, for curing. And they have really put a lot of effort in, in creating a great product, which is what they deserve, because they are people, very hardworking people, and, and willing to, to take the risk and invest in a product that is becoming a hit, like uh, this uh, rapid sandwiches. Well, we serve these people. Thank you. As far as so, what sizes are available uh, with the Matilde Astura? We're gonna have uh, three sizes, right? It's a Corona, a Pido, and a. Uh, it's a Corona, a Robusto, and a Toro Bravo. Toro yeah, but I'm smoking a Toro Bravo right now. Yes, yes you're yeah. smoking the Toro Bravo. We're all smoking the Toro Bravo, which is a 54 by six and a half. Yeah, our Corona is a 44 by uh, five and a half, and then we have the Robusto, which originally in the Renace line was a little bit uh, bigger range gauge, which is 54 by five and a quarter. And for this line, we decided to reduce it to a 50. So now it's a 50 and five and a quarter. And then with each of these sizes, do you blend? I mean, you blended specifically for that size, correct? Yes, we do. Yes, it's a. Uh that's, that's the way it is, you know. Every, you want to have in one cigar the components that make the cigar on, on the three or four or five elements that you offer to the market. In order to do that, you have to manage your filler in such a way that you I use a, a number of grams or you know, a number of leaves and half leaves and a quarter leaves you know, so that you put together this blend it is going to be family with another blend in the same or the, the different lineage. They will taste in certain things similar, and in other things are going to be a little bit different. So instead of having a, a brother in the family, a cousin in the family, we have the same blood that you know, we prefer some of our sons and, our, and nephews and so forth. But uh, yes, it's, that's the way it is. It's blended through the... the uh, to maintain that the taste for everything, you know, as a guy. Maintain now. that same taste profile. Same taste for everything. And, you know, as far as the, um, 
the profile you were going for for this, were you going for the uh, the everyday smoker or someone maybe who prefers something stronger? I think uh, the target is stronger because if you smoke it, uh, it will give you a kick, you know, into it, into your system. Uh, it will be strong. Uh, it's, sometimes you start with, with, you know, hard, uh, you know, taste, strong taste. Uh, but the moment you continue, you know, uh, start this smoking the cigarette, then it will smooth out a lot. A lot. And create a, a, a good but the, the whole purpose is to give give people that likes you know very strong cigars an opportunity to try that you know desire in the uh, oscuro. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the things I like about the the oscuro is that, uh, like that, and I said, it's a cigar that packs a lot of strength, but uh, you won't really feel it that much. Uh, although it has a lot of strength, it's very smooth to the palate. So it's a very nice, smooth tasting cigar. So if you're looking for a lot of strength, something that packs a lot, you can smoke it, but you can also smoke it at, uh, at a moment you're looking for something more medium body because it's gonna be very smooth for the palate. I, I, I agree with you on that because what I love about this cigar is I can smoke an, another cigar afterwards and my palate's not shot. So I can, I can have another cigar and, and that's a big thing for me when I have a cigar. If I have a cigar and it shoots my palate and then I can't enjoy another cigar in the day, this one I absolutely can, can do that. It has a very clean finish. What are some of the notes that you guys get from this cigar? I get, I get a lot of nice cocoa notes off this cigar. Um, really, you know, just those smooth cocoa notes, which I love. It is a definitely to the animal type of, you know, strong, uh, sugary, uh, type of description of aromas and taste. Uh, you, you find that uh, this uh, earth, you know, stable place in this kind of, of uh, complex, you know, uh, combination of taste and, and aromas. I perceive too in the, in the cigar a uh, lot of uh, earth, you know, uh, and some, some other things that, uh, you know... Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I get that cocoa out of it, but I get a lot of the earthy flavors. Yeah. I also like, uh, it has a very uh, nice lingly, lingering uh, peppery note. Yep. On the side of your tongue, which it's always there, but it's a nice, smooth... It's uh, long as well. Not aggressive pepper. It's just like right there tingling all the time. Yeah. Something I like very yeah. much about this cigar. Yeah, and I suppose it's a long finish, but it's not that... It's not that bad after you get that clean finish. It's so loud but not overpowering, I would say. Yeah. If you, I think the, the best uh, time that I have have had today to see out here is uh, like a, a breakfast time with coffee, black coffee, and then you have a, a, a powerful, you know, waking you up experience in you know, this <laughs> combination. Yeah, it's I a, love a, 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 I love that too. I love having a, a nice bold smoke in the morning with a black coffee. Uh, Paul, my partner, he, he tends to go for a lighter smoke in the morning, um, but I do like that bold smoke in the morning with, with, a, with a black coffee. Yes. Dad has a theory that uh, a shot of caffeine and a cigar will always keep him up in the morning. Oh, yeah. So every crazy. time he wakes up, he has his little coffee and uh, lights up a cigar. It gives me ammunition to continue. Energy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I got one more question actually on the blend. So, and actually, I was I was actually just talking to, and we'll get into this part a little bit with Man. I was actually talking to Manuel Casada um, today, right. and um, he in his in his uh, Casada uh, Reserva Pravada, he incorporated some Pennsylvania tobacco into the filler, and he said he did it for two reasons. One is he, obviously for some flavor, but he also said that that was a tobacco that had some some natural strengths to it. And in this blend, I heard you mention you have, you do have Pennsylvania tobacco. Yes. Was that kind of what you were thinking with this blend as well? Uh, I, I I have been in contact with uh, broadleaf for fillers, a broadleaf for wrappers uh, since many years ago. Okay. Uh, I use the I use the Pennsylvania because it's strong, and I want to have something strong going there. With, with the, uh, a couple of things a little strong, maybe another one to be minor, but. But uh, that's the reason why I, I took uh, this this one because I knew 
the one that was broadleaf uh, from the Connecticut broadleaf, and this one is Pennsylvania, uh, which is stronger than the Connecticut broadleaf. But it's been around for many years. And uh, we, we use this in uh, cigars like uh, uh, Primo de Rey, you know, things that are very fast, Casadores, things like that. Uh, so it's, it's they've been we've been in touch with it for, for many years so, so far. Yeah, but definitely it packs a lot of strength and it has very good flavor to it. So it yeah. it has a lot to do with uh, the blend. Sure. No, absolutely. I guess the way those tobaccos are going to marry together, I, I would definitely get that as well. What is what is your favorite sizes each of this blend right now? Well, I'm smoking now. Definitely, this my favorite size. I think I like the Toro a lot. Uh, in this size, I mean, uh, I don't like the Henna Set. In this size, I like uh, the other way around. I like the Toro, Robusto, and then the Corona. They're all great smokes, but uh, the taste profiles that each give, that's the way I would go. On the other side with the Henna Set, I would go the other way uh, the other way around. I would go with the smaller ring gauges and then go uh, to the bigger ring gauges. I, I like also the, the, the Toro, Bravo. Uh, it's a it's a cigar that just give me everything I need for uh, to smoke. You know, the short for most two is uh, is too, too small. This one is about right. Yeah, you and, uh, it's yeah. Great. yeah. Now, I I just love this band. Um, yeah. I love the band you had on uh, Renaissance. This, how did you guys come? Because this green just looks beautiful on this dark wrapper. I mean, you wouldn't, you'd say someone, a, a green and gold wrapper, they would probably not say, but it just, how did you guys come up with this design with that? <laughs> that uh, very little is, uh, well, is basically, that. yeah, basically, uh, how it went on was that with the Hina line, we were looking for something very uh, nice and elegant. So we got the brown, uh, brown color with the brown box, something very classical. And it came to a point where because we had a, such a small footprint, it was unfortunately getting lost a little bit in the humidors. I mean, imagine a humidor has, you know, hundreds of boxes and you have four different boxes which are wooden. And during the line, we came with the idea of say, okay, let's do this. Let's keep, let's keep the logo, let's keep the ring and change the colors. And what we're looking for is looking for different colors that would have that contrast with the wrapper that will actually make it pop out in the humidor. So we basically have different colors uh, selected and we chose uh, the green because we believe it looked very, very elegant and it also popped out extremely well. The gold, the green, and the dark wrapper, basically the dark wrapper will make that gold and green pop out. And with a box, the box, green box will make that wrapper pop out. So it was, something that would look very elegant and would still pop out in the humorous. Or that's what, you know, that was the science behind it and that we're looking and hoping that would happen. I, I think you absolutely succeeded with that. And, and you know, it's it's not gimmicky. It's very classic looking and it does, it, the contrast on that. When I remember when you sent me the first picture of that cigar, I just said, wow, it just, it really popped out with the green. Um, and you put that nice secondary band on here too, which I, I love the fact that you have a secondary band on this cigar as well. It's so a good looking cigar. Really, <laughs> so it, it really is. It, really. Yeah, it really is. Well, I don't want to forget about the Renaissance line because um, that's a great line. That was your first line. Um, let's just kind of recap. I mean, you, you, now you released um, the Lancero earlier this year, but for, for that line, for folks who may not be familiar or need a refresher. Can you talk a little about that line? That line was, uh, of course, our first line. Uh, it was the first thing that came out of uh, the, the tables, the holding tables, uh, that had uh, the way we want to make, make cigars uh, at the time. You know, what to, don't, don't take any short pots. Uh, do uh, as many, as needed, as the right amount of pots you have so you didn't get uh, we didn't get the uh, you know veins in excess blends for revising you know, several times you know to find it in other words we put all our efforts towards that that uh, brand and we love it you know we still love, love it you know, it's, uh, we, we, it, it has in there 
a lot of our time on, on, on sweat, you know, making it a great CR, which I think we did. Uh, and the more people the test the taste the CR, the more people like me, uh, which is fantastic. You know, well, I think it's a great line. I mean, we've had uh, we've had good success with it. Uh, I mean, it was not even a year in the market, and we were uh, rated uh, a top twenty-five as cigar is now a number nineteen cigar, which we're we honored to do. It started as a line, took about well, it took that about eight months to develop because we went on through a lot of lines. We ended up with this uh, beautiful medium body, medium full body cigar, which has a lot of nice coffee notes, very uh, chocolatey coffee notes. And it was a combination of, well, it is a combination of Dominican tobacco and Nicaraguan and has an Habano Ecuadorian wrapper. It has four sizes, four regular sizes, which is a Corona. You have a, your Rebuso, which is 54 by five and a quarter, a Toro, which is a same thing as a 54 and six and a half, and a Grande, which is 60 by six. We mentioned the Lancero, well, you mentioned the Lancero, which is a 40 by seven. It, this came in a 40, comes in a 40 box count, and it was made to commemorate Dad's 40th year in the cigar industry. It was, I think it was very, very good cigar. It had very good acceptance. We had 624 boxes uh, made, which most of them are sold, and we've had very good feedback with that, too. Right. And in making all the this cigars, uh, we actually experimented with uh, new controls, control methods, you know, for, for draw, for construction, uh, which uh, are helping us keeping our cigars, you know, within in an ideal range of smoking, uh, which uh, it's allows you to smoke better. Instead of being worried about the cigar, you're being plugged or you're being too hard to go to lose to go. You have that uh, every material is being tested so that it gives you the opportunity to, to have control over your smoke, meaning that you are getting to smoke as you need it and uh, enjoy it, you know, instead of uh, having to we like that, you know, once and again, or having to worry about the runner. It's not that they're going to appear, you know, this is all a natural product, but you have taken this to the minimum that is possible. Actually, we have learned a lot, you know, from uh, making this CR. You know, so I went back to, to my roots, which is on the floor. And uh, I had a great time, you know, with the development of the blend and making it and, and smoking it. Oh, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned the cigar aficionado it was the number 18, correct? And the, it was the Corona? Number 19, the Corona. 19. That, I mean, yes. for a first year company, I, I don't care who, you know, that cigar aficionado, a lot of times they don't, um, it's typically they, they, they want to wait a little while to warm up, I think, to a company. That's my opinion. But a first year to get on that list, uh, that's a great honor. That's a great, it is. it's a great cigar. We look at that way, it's a great cigar, yes, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, uh, very yeah, honored my, for yeah, we were very honored and very excited with it. Yeah, well deserved, too. The um, the Robusto is actually, I love the Corona, but the Robusto actually is my favorite in that. Um, now, the Lancero, you mentioned it is a limited. Is that an ongoing limited production, or is it one and done? Uh, it's one and done. Oh, it was wow. There's only 620, 20, 624 boxes made, and... Uh, and that's about it. So, that, so folks are seeing those Lanceros on the shelf, you advise them to get them as well. That's right. Go get them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great cigar. That Lancero is a, it, it, that blend in the Lancero, fine representation as well. Um, just a great, it's a really, really nice Lancero. Well, we are the very, some, some people call me, call me obsessive about the you know, quality. <laughs> just a bit, just a bit. And they tell me, you know, they are just made by five people, you know. Like I said, <laughs> hands, you know, hands. So, well, but uh, I wanted to have that. Uh, when you smoke, you say, wow, this is well, it's well made and so forth. And the blend is also important. It's, it's the, the most important part of it. But making these cigars into a nice, you know, smoking, make the blend and make it a great cigar for smoking. Like you smoke it at the right, you know, suction. Even though it's a very mechanical thing to say, but it does help a lot our artisans to, to, to use perfume. 
Exactly. Exactly. So another um, piece of news that you folks made this year was, um, and I just mentioned uh, Manuel Casada before, but you now are um, working with Casada Cigars and they're handling your distribution, correct? Yes, that's correct. So talk to me a little about that because, you know, sometimes, a lot of times companies, you know, they, they either want to control their own distribution or they want to, you know, they will outsource it. What led to the decision actually to do that? Uh, well, yeah. it, it was basically, um, that's always had experience in the manufacturing side. And uh, we started with our own distribution and it came to a point where I guess it was a little bit, uh, I guess, too much for us, you know, handling the manufacturing, the blending, the promoting, and also the distribution was taking a lot of time from us. And we decided to cut back, let's say, draw back and find somebody that we trusted and knew and had that network and had that net distribution and work with them. We believe that Casalas have great distribution. They have um, a lot of experience in distributing in the market. And they were doing well. They've been doing a very good job with it, and we're very happy with it. Right. And uh, Manolo is a, is a person, is a guy that we know for forever. You know? I remember uh, working with Manuel in the 70s uh, with uh, Consolidated Cigars at that time. And we actually sent uh, him orders for cigars. Because coming out of the Canary Islands, uh, we found that uh, it, was, it was too much orders and we didn't have enough capacity to produce. So we actually bought CR from Manolo uh, in those years. So we know Manolo and, and having him, uh, you know, shipping all CRs and distributing it is for us uh, something that doesn't worry at all. You know, we know they're in good hands. And it allows us to concentrate in uh, basically in the plant development and the promotion of the cigar. And that makes sense from a small company, too, where you could really put that attention there. What I've noticed about Casada Cigars, um, and I know they distribute Regis as well, and I see this now with your brand, they really, that's an integral part of their portfolio with their sales force right now. So they're, you know, a lot of times you're not getting forgotten about. They're, they're right there with, um, with those, uh, the Casada Cigars as well. In fact, I was, I was, when I saw Manolo today, I was asking my shop, I said, you guys got to get the Matildes in here. So, yeah, so, I mean, they really do treat that. I think that's a great thing to have, that you can have a distribution partner that you can trust like that. Yes, definitely. Sleep well better every time. So, Jose, you know, you've, um, you, when you came back into the business, um, this time you brought your sons into the business. And right. um, so I want to know, what's it like working with your sons? And Enrique, what's it like working with your dad right now? <laughs> I'll let him tell it and I'll tell my story. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's difficult. It is difficult. Uh, but it's doable. Uh, and you can see why I'm saying that because it's, it's just not inventing anything. I'm just uh, showing you the, the real thing. You see Enrique working great. I'm very proud of his work. He's uh, take over my position you know, someday soon. Uh, so I am I'm very happy that he likes uh, the cigar industry, and because of that, I'm, I'm willing to tolerate you know all the things that he does that I, I ever don't like. It. But in general, I'm very happy with what he does, and uh, we have find a way to work together. Uh, love is uh, in there. Uh, opinions are not going to be the same. It can it can differ, it can vary. And I think that's comfortable for him and for me. Always looking for what is true. And, uh, and making sure that, that, that guide our, our, our behavior together. In my case, I mean, as he was saying, I mean, he raised me correctly. He raised me to have an opinion. Sometimes we don't have the same opinion. When you're working with family, I guess it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit harder because you have more trust. So you're there and you say what you believe instead of, you know, trying to hide it because at, at the end of the game, he's my father and I know he knows a lot more than I do and I'm learning a lot from him. When I think I, you know, I have an opinion, I'll say it and maybe we'll clash with that opinion. Este, from 
I mean, a stance point, I've been learning a lot from him and I'm very happy from it. And I have a lot to learn before I actually get to fill his uh, shoes. But I've been working hard to do it. And I mean, for me, it's been awesome. I mean, since I was a kid, I used to dream to have, you know, have something with that and working with cigars. I've always liked to go to the cigar factory when he was working, uh, you know, like 15 hours, 16 hours a day. We used to play around there and I always used to make fun of him saying that someday when he retires, we'll, you know, make something smaller where he didn't have to work that much. And I guess this is it. I mean, he's still working, he's still enjoying and we're together and I'm learning. So hopefully it's going to be a long run. It will be. Absolutely. Now, you've gone from this big factory, Jose, to a small factory. Um, is it, what, what, do you like the small factory? Is this just something that you feel you could be a little more hands-on with, or do you miss the big factory? Uh, no, I don't miss the big factory at all. You know. uh, it's, uh, it's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's a way to, it's a very, uh, most, most common way, way to run a business is through, you know, management and, and you know, delegation of, of power to different people at different levels in the organization. That in a big company can be very slow. Uh, one and two is uh, in a shell on the, the, the positioning in, in headquarters, usually as they should be, you know, uh, are, are made by people that are not connected to the, the particular line of business. And that I hate, you know, because if you, if you know something, you are you have earned the right to to do what you, you know, say whatever you want, you know, but uh, or order whatever you want to order, but make decisions based on, on, on sometimes uh, other than, uh, you know, performance, it's, it's not, uh, for me, it's not correct. Uh, I feel better working by myself. Uh, I don't care if I go well or go bad. I try to be, be, be you know, do the right thing. I have to take it uh, and, and, and go ahead and, and do the best I can. Uh, but I tell you, I have fun working as I am, as I am now. Uh, also, I decide to uh, have fun. I think one of the nice mm -hmm. things about small working in a small factory mm -hmm. was having that, uh, that communication with the employees. You can talk directly to them. Oh, that's, that's key. Definitely, yes, definitely, definitely. I had that uh, to a certain extent in, in my previous employment. But uh, in this, uh, this time around, it's a it's a real you know one to one relationship you know, and uh, that's great people when they get into that position it's, uh, it's beneficial for for everyone. Great, that's that's interesting. So a couple of questions um, related to the industry. Um, first up, as you know, you're aware, U.S. right now market we're really in a battle with the FDA. We don't know where this is going to go, other than we know that there's some regulations coming. Um, right now, given that and that you're a small company, are you kind of maybe saying, well, maybe we should look at markets outside the U.S.? Are you already looking at international markets? Yeah, I think I can I'll give you details on that, but uh, yes, we are. Already. Yeah, I mean, obviously, U.S. is always going to be the main market. It's one of the biggest, well, it is the biggest market. Um, but we've been looking at different various markets as a small company. Um, in Europe. We've been working with Germany, with Switzerland, uh, been talking to other markets to start opening up. As you said, I mean, the FDA regulations come in, it's going to affect us a lot of small companies. And considering we've been, in, you know, we just launched in 2012, it's going to affect us even more. So yeah, in essence, we have been looking for different markets. We're working with different markets, but always keeping focus in the United States for now, well, for now and hopefully forever. Are the products available in Europe yet? Yes. Okay. We have products available in, uh, right now, German market and Swiss market, and we're working with different with other markets. Uh, hopefully, we'll be closing those markets uh, soon, and I can let you know when we have them done. That would be awesome, yeah, because we do have a lot of listeners uh, in Europe, actually, so glad to hear that. And then, I got to ask this question, because, and you've probably been asked this a hundred times, but... Um, I'll ask it anyway. What are the thoughts of what's happening with the U.S., possibly the Cuban market opening to the U.S.? 
Well, the art, uh, as, as in everything, different opinions. And I think it's going to be a, uh, a the people wanting to get the, the cigars that are Cubans, for those people who have been exposed to the Cubans already. I think the industry has been preparing itself for the entry of Cuba to the market by producing the best cigar ever produced in the United States uh, that I remember of. They can have quality in different places, in different companies. Uh, but uh, it's, it's all that is in preparation, I think, of the opening of, of, of the U.S. market to, to Cuban products. So I think people will try to find them. Uh, they will try to buy, they will, to buy, they will do it and smoke some. And then probably they will realize that they are not as good as uh, as you know, many people say, uh, they are just a, a different offer of a great product. You know? And I don't see why, why we cannot live together. You know? I think in the end, uh, each one will find its niche and uh, work it out and make sure that we are there. Uh, and uh, I don't feel terribly bad about it. I'm you know, not afraid of it. I think we're going to be successful in in, in making the Republic so. I think the Dominican Republic has established itself as one of the prime manufacturers or the prime manufacturer of female cigars in the world and we've been in that position for a long time. So I, as Dad was saying, we've been preparing a lot with that consistency, that manufacturing that people are looking for. So as Dad told me a couple of days ago, I mean, it's a battle we're preparing for and we'll be ready to fight it when it comes. But meanwhile, we'll enjoy uh, not having the Cubans in uh, the U.S. and see what happens then. Yeah, I mean, it. what I'm seeing happen, in the, and there's great cigars coming out of other countries, but in the last few years, what I'm seeing going on in the Dominican Republic in terms of the tobacco and the quality of the product, I've been very, very impressed with. So I, I, think, I think, if anything, it's going to raise everyone's game even better, is what I look right. at it. That's what is going to happen. Right? Definitely. Now, I, you know, I hear a lot of folks basically say, you know, say, well, they're interested in possibly seeing blends with the Cuban tobacco. I actually talked to Manolo about it, and he said he doesn't think that's going to be a very easy thing to do, just for getting that tobacco. What What are your thoughts on that in terms of putting Cuban tobacco in some Dominican blends? It depends on how the the structure is going to rest for for you know after Fidel goes. Uh, I think the Cubans are going to be very jealous of uh, their products, the, the tobacco leaf. However, in the past, uh, we used to, the United States used to get a lot of uh, Cuban tobacco from Cuba to, uh, to manufacture cigars, to make cigars in, in the south, in Tampa, uh, and so forth. So, uh, I think the leaf is going to be found, uh, you know, the cash is going to be determining you know, how soon and to whom. And uh, I think once we have the uh, Cuban tobacco, uh, eventually, we're going to make great, great blends with uh, Nicaraguans and Americans. Definitely. Oh, I guess if you can, you know. Of course, so, so just an opinion. You know. I'm not a politician you know, with that kind of stuff. You know. I guess if you're able to get a Cuban tobacco, as Manuel was saying, I guess it's going to be pretty hard to do, but. If it's available, it's another ingredient to play with to make it blend. I mean, it just gives you a wider range of tobaccos to work with to make greater cigars. I also saw people that you know are closer to tobacco uh, speak about and talk about uh, you know Cuba using some other countries' tobacco. So, sure. I don't know. I don't know what substitutes in this. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I, I think we're still a few years away, actually, in the U.S. with that, too. I don't think we're going to see anything in the next couple of years. It's, it's not going to move fast here, is my opinion. Um, although I think at some point it is going to open. Um, so what's next for Matilde Cigars? Now, you, I know you just crossed the score, but what are you guys thinking about down the road? Is, is there anything, any of our projects you're talking about or thinking about right now that you could share? It's okay if you can't as well. We, we were always uh, thinking on doing testing on new products. Uh, we, we are trying to position ourselves in such a way that we have access to more tobaccos, 
every time more, and then uh, keep our our hands on to making you know different different blends as we go, and that will have to be difficult to to decide. Uh, what was the time he thinking is the right one to produce uh, new blends? But we, we're going to make blends as a matter of almost like a matter of policy for us you know, to do that every year. We're definitely going to working on different blends. Uh, one thing I can say that uh, our next cigar would be a uh, box press. Oh wow! That's, That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, we'll keep you posted with the rest of uh, rest of the news when it starts coming out. Awesome. Yep, we'll look forward to that as well. So, taking Matilde cigars off the table for each of you, if there's one cigar you like to smoke that's not a Matilde cigar, what cigar is that? I, I never say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like the cigars I make, you know. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. No, I can say Dad's always smoked the cigar he's made. I mean, when he was uh, working with uh, his prior employer, I mean, he had such a big range of cigars to smoke and such a big range of, of blends to smoke for. I mean, we never got out of that range. Same thing as I did. When I started smoking, we had so many blends and so many eight cigars at the factory that I just kept with that. Este, there are definitely very great cigars out there. Este, but I was actually talking to Dad about this a while ago, and it's like, it seems that we are always smoking... Um, Always smoking Matildas or something that we're working on, because it's not only the blends that uh, that are out there. Not that I said not the Oscura, but you're always trying different cigars. So it's you're always occupied trying different blends, trying different variations of blends, and uh, that's basically what we've been doing for a while. There's definitely some cigars that uh, we smoked, oh I smoked and I liked a lot, but not much that I like. Say okay, this is my go-to cigar after Matilda. I usually just stick with Matilda or something that we're working on. Great. Awesome, Jose and Enrique. Hey. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, coming on the show here. Um, you got fantastic product. I think you know you guys are doing some amazing work, um, and we appreciate you coming on the show again. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Thank you for the invitation. We appreciate it. I look, I look forward to seeing you soon. Um, for folks who are still on uh, the show, we are doing two other segments. Um, these will just, you know, they are tape recorded. They were pre-recorded segments on Debonair and our Stogies of the Week. But um, I will be in the chat room, so these will be kind of live segments. Uh, so feel free to interact as we go along. Thank you, Jose and Enrique. And with that, we'll take a break. <laughs> 